Hi, and welcome to American Snippets. I am your co-founder, Barb Allen. And today we are going to do something just a little bit different because before we get started, before we get into this interview with today's guest, I want you all to do something to set yourself up to fully experience everything this guest has to offer. I want you all to stop and think of one thing that you really, really want to achieve in your life, whether it is just learning how to get a good night's sleep every night, maybe you want to double your income, lose a ton of weight, maybe there's someone in your family that you don't have a good relationship with, maybe you're looking for that relationship, that real love that you've always wanted to find, maybe you want to write a book, whatever it is, think about that, lock onto that for one second. Tag on now everything in your environment, in your family, in your town, your community, your job, even your country, anything it is that you think needs to be fixed, needs to be improved, you would change if only you could. Things that you would get done in your life and in your, in your environment if you only had the ability to do so, if only you could catch that break that other people seem to catch, but you can't catch it. Ask yourself now, now that you got those things locked into your head, Ask yourself, what is it? Why haven't you done those things? What is keeping you from achieving all of those things or getting involved to make a difference in all of those things? Is it the economy or your boss or an annoying coworker? Is it your health? Are you strapped with a debilitating disease? Are you in prison? Have you been victimized by another person? Has somebody taken a love from you? What is it? What is the reason? What is the root cause that you have not been able to find or hang on to that happiness? that you so want. And then ask yourself, are you committed to making those changes and to making all of those things happen? If you could only catch that break that you want, that you see everybody else catching, but you can never seem to catch yourself. If you've done all that, you're ready now to get ready to meet our guest today, Dr. Sean Stevenson. Dr. Sean Stevenson was supposed to die at birth. This is what all the doctors said. He was supposed to be his parents were prepared to were told to prepare to bury their son in about 24 hours after after he had died. I mean, after he had been born, uh, he wasn't supposed to grow up. He wasn't supposed to go to school. He wasn't supposed to graduate college. He wasn't supposed to fall in love or become wildly successful or do any of those things that he has systematically done one by one by one. He's never met an excuse that he's afraid of. He's known around the world now for helping others, for overcoming not only his own struggles, but showing others how to overcome theirs. Jimmy Kimmel calls him the Yoda of personal development with less pointy ears. <laughs> and I think that's a pretty fun and accurate description today on American Snippets. We are super honored to have Dr. Sean Stevenson sitting here with us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, I'd like it if you could read that intro to me every morning when I get out of bed <laughs> because I sound really cool, way cooler than I really am. And then when you started with the questions to your audience about what do they want, I was like, ah, oh, I want some of those things too. And so it's my pleasure to be here. Good. Thank you so much for, again, for joining us. Well, for those of you who don't know your story, maybe we'll, we'll touch on that before we get into all these other things. You were born with osteogenesis imperfecta known as brittle bone disease. And, um, your parents were told to expect you to die. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. So the challenge with that is I came into this world with doubters and the beauty of that is I came into this world with doubters to compete against. And, you know, I know that it must have been traumatizing to my parents uh, to have been given the prognosis of my death, you know, within the first few hours of my life. Um, but it's kind of the beginning of a great story. Uh that has continued to unfold. And as I tell my audiences, you know, 38 years later, all those doctors that told my parents that they're all dead, <laughs> and I'm the only doctor in that room that remains. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's been a, it's been a journey. It's not been easy. Uh, there are days where uh I doubt myself and become my own greatest enemy. So it's uh, it's a daily learning experience. 
Your parents, uh, I obviously, I read your book and we're going to touch more on that later. I read this book. I love this book and I'm going to continue harping on this book because it is one of those books. If I had had years ago when I was thrust into my own turmoil would have helped me change, change the game significantly before it got ugly on me. But um, in that book, you speak often of your parents as well. And they sound like such extraordinary people. I say this both as someone who's gone through things and as a parent who's raised children through our own trouble. Um, my husband died when my kids were very young. And so I had to lead them through that. And as a parent who has to help their child struggle with something and overcome something, I have such respect for how your parents addressed your life because they never saw it as anything to be addressed. They just saw it as this is our son and this is, they just saw it as the way it is. And um, you want to share some stories about some things that your parents did to help you as a child, where the, the timers they set for crying, you know, for how long that you were allowed to have your pity parties and um, some of the things they said to you, the fun things they did with your wheelchair and what that did for you as a child growing up for your own mindset to, to help you decide how you were going to to deal with, with what you were dealing with. Yeah. So my parents, when I was young, they had the mentality of don't focus on what you can't do. Can't start focusing on what you can do. And they also had the mentality that it's okay to feel sorry for yourself, but you can't spend very long doing it. Um, you're not going to be able to be on the basketball team, but if you work hard enough someday, you could own a basketball team. Uh, they built floats around my wheelchair so that I had cool costumes, like uh, I was a tractor one year, I was a bulldozer <laughs> one year, I was a race car, I was a coffin, I was, uh, you know, they just the list goes on and on. And, um, you know, there's there's no doubt that I had a very painful childhood but it it's not something I look back on and and like horror it's like you know we we dealt with it we dealt the best we could with it and you know there's there's something that goes into life uh, when your imprinting years are presented with really good role models and uh, you know I, I became a therapist later in life and I must say, the most heartbreaking thing I have to deal with with my clients is seeing the damage done from parents who were not equipped well to raise children. And, of course, I believe in my core that everybody does the best they can with the resources they have. But some people just don't have many resources. And if you grew up and you were neglected and abused, that it doesn't have to hold you down for the rest of your life, but it certainly is going to make your road more challenging than those that do not have that. So what do you tell your clients then who come to you and, and have had that gap in their childhood to have, you know, from birth yeah. through their into their adult life, they're still dealing as an adult with everything that was done to them as a child? Well, to use a, I'm not a religious man. I was raised religious, but to use a Christianity term, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or not uh, to understand this metaphor, but it's like everybody has their own cross to bear. Right. And some people, the challenge that they carry is they were raised by parents that, were not present or loving or or prepared to handle children. Some people were born with physical disabilities. Some people were injured later um, when they were growing up. Some people got abused by a teacher or, you know, we all go through life. Uh, with our own challenges, and no one comes out unscathed. I've never met a person, even those that feel like, oh, I had a decent childhood. If you peel back the layers, they had some form of trauma in some way. It may not be comparable to other people's traumas, but I found that pain is pain is pain. When you're cut from the high school basketball team and you made it your whole life's purpose to make the team, right. that is heartbreaking to the child 
if you are beaten as a child by your stepdad, that is heartbreaking. You you can get into this, you know, boxing match, if you will, of like, oh, well, this one had it worse. But emotions are emotions are emotions. If you don't know anything else, that's the most pain you've ever been exposed to. That was a lot of pain. Um, and the challenge we get into as a society is when we say, well, my pain was worse than yours. Yes. So, so like, is losing a child more painful to a woman than a woman who is sexually assaulted? Is losing a job and not being able to afford your family's, you know, daily income and keeping them around, is that as challenging as coming down with a disease? Like, when we get into that game of which one's worse or I have it worse, Dollars. You know, um, I deal with that a lot. And I had dealt with that. I had, I had to learn all of those things the hard way um, in the world of those who are in grief. There's often a lot of comparison. And this is one of the key things that can divide some families whose pain is worse, who's suffering worse. So that is such a such a strong point that we like to ram home. And I'm so glad you said that because a lot of the people who do message us and reach out to us struggle with that very issue. And you touched upon something I want to just circle back to very quickly about what well, you said teachers, but uh, you know, that was, it was in a different light, but I want to ask you quickly about teachers who came to your house, because I know I have a family of teachers. My husband was also a teacher. My sisters are a teacher, you know, a, a lot. I'm very involved or I know of that, that life. And what is it about a teacher? What is the difference a teacher can make in a child's life a child who is struggling with all these policies now that are implemented, how teachers are regulated, told they must do this, must do that. Do you think teachers they today- need to carry guns. <laughs> yeah, they need to carry guns, right. Do you think yeah. they would have been able to come to your house? A teacher today would be able to come to a student's house the way that they came to your house, right? And would teach you when, because when you broke a bone, we'll, we'll go back again. When, when you would injure yourself and break a bone, you would have to stay in that same exact spot. So if you were on your kitchen floor and broke a bone, you would have to stay immobilized there for days. Yes. Yeah, about four to six weeks. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. I, <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable uh, how you all came through that. And your teachers would come to the house and teach you right there on the floor. Yeah. What does, mm -hmm. I mean, that's extraordinary. Can you imagine a teacher today doing that or being able, not that they wouldn't even want to, but could they? Well, these teachers came on their own time. Yeah, They didn't come during the school time. So there was that of their own kindness. Um, and, you know, I can't say whether or not they could have done that today because I don't know. Um, but I can tell you that we all look back on our childhood and we can probably remember one, if not a few teachers that just lit us up as, yeah. and had a huge impact. Like, um, you know, you ask most, most people, they'll give you at least one name uh -huh. that'll be like, wow, that teacher just, they were there for me. They, they, and if you find just through a little investigation, it's not because they had the best lectures. It's not because they were, they gave the easiest homework. It's not because uh, they gave you the best grades. The ones that you remember that had the huge impact were the ones that you felt cared about you personally. Yes. And cared more about your well being than your education, even. And that is the heart of an amazing teacher. You know, my sister is, a, is an elementary teacher herself. And you know, I I know that even though I reach millions of people a year through online videos, it, it, the way she's reaching those same, I don't know, couple hundred students in her school, uh, it's it's just as important. Yes. It's, it's just as important because those children, you know, those kids' lives are, are being formed in the imprinting years. And students oftentimes spend more time with their teachers than their own parents. Yes. And so they're getting constant exposure to these adults. And if they, those adults can pass on really great attitudes and viewpoints and, and teach them about patience and all of those important values through just day-to-day -day, uh, classes, 
it has a massive impact in that student's life. And looking back on my childhood, you know, I, my disability was very polarizing to my teachers uh, because either the teachers didn't know how to handle it. Cause you got to remember when I was going through school, um, the ADA hadn't been passed yet. The Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, you know, I was the first kid in my school in a wheelchair ever. Wow. And so they, they didn't know quite how to handle, you know, mainstreaming wasn't a word. Inclusion wasn't a word uh, back then in, in education. And so when I came into the world and then I went off to school, either teachers were like, we're going to figure it out. We're just going to make it work. And he's a student just like anybody else. And then there were the teachers that freaked out and didn't know how to handle me or didn't want to work with me. Literally, one teacher said to my parents, wouldn't Sean feel better with his own kind? Oh, my and, gosh. And and they're like, what? <laughs> his own kind. And I don't think that that teacher was some kind of bigot or a mean person. I just think they were uneducated about how to deal with somebody with wow. a disability. I think they didn't have the experience. And so they got scared themselves. Wow. That's I can't imagine as a, a as parent, even if a teacher came to me and said that about my kid, and I don't know how. My parents were used to it. I knew they, the, the nurses told my mom, you know, you should dry up your mother's milk because who would want to nurse a child like that? Oh, yeah. my goodness. Um, your so parents. They, they got used to it. They, and, I um, guess so. Nothing, you know, I still deal with ignorant racism, not racism, ignorant disabilityism, if you will, um, discrimination. And unlike, say, like racism or sexism, where there's a lot of like, like anger and hate there, yeah. when people discriminate against somebody with a disability, there's oftentimes, just a, it's often a case of ignorance. It's, it's, they've never been exposed to it. They're mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Uh, that doesn't make it right. It's just, if you can learn how to educate people and, you know, when I roll into somebody's life, my mentality is they may never have known somebody three feet tall in a wheelchair. And so it's my yeah. responsibility, in my view, to make the experience enjoyable and also teach them what's important and, and how to interact with somebody with a disability. I feel like I'm an educator myself every day that I I come into the mainstream world that's not used to somebody with a disability. And that is something that is just repeated in in every in, in your interviews and your book even. One of the favorite quotes of yours I found, because your book, by the way, if somebody ever just wanted to make a calendar of quotes, I mean, just your book, like, <laughs> does it, it's full of, but they're genuine too. Um, you say, I'm not in the business of babysitting victims. You know, I'm here to teach people how to become victors, something to that effect, right? I love that quote for everything that it says and for your stance on pity being a drug. You know, it's a, one of the most debilitating drugs. I think if there's one message that you manage to resonate with in people over and over and over again, I think that's the most important message that you have and you convey it in such a way that people are able to grasp it because you don't come at them. This is a gift of yours. You don't come at people with anger or um, self-righteousness or any of well, that. People don't, people don't realize why I don't do that. I don't do that because I'm some morally high evolved being. I, I don't do that because that doesn't work. Right. <laughs> like, but you've exactly. taught yourself that you've learned that and you have right. that discipline and you have yeah. that capacity and you're at, you've, you have found a way to be at peace with that, um, where it's it doesn't a daily get process, you. Yeah. It's a daily process because I think it's easy for somebody to listen to this program right now. On the other end of this microphone, there's somebody listening with headphones or speakers yeah. and they're like, oh gosh, I'd love to have Sean's view of the world. I'd love to be that confident, that positive, that happy. And what they're not tuning into then is the reality of the fact that I have to practice everything I'm teaching daily. Yes. And that's why I teach it. I tell people, if I didn't do what, I what I'm doing on this planet, I would be riddled with my insecurities. I would be 
a complete, anxious, fearful, judgmental, frustrated human. And that's why I teach this is because I need to hear this day in and day out. Day, like even when people quote my own books, I'm like, oh, crap, I needed to hear that this morning. You know, and it's like, <laughs> like just, be, just because you know something intellectually doesn't mean you don't need it conditioned daily. Yeah, it is a choice you have to make every single day. It is a discipline and you have to, and the more often you make that choice, that's how you develop it into a habit. But the habit is still vulnerable to- And I pay the consequences. I pay yeah. the same consequences that you do when mm -hmm. I don't apply these lessons. Mm -hmm. You know, I I can slip in, I have, and, and I'm guaranteed for the rest of my life, I will have moments where I will slip into depression or upset or anger. You know, you can't extract the negative emotions from a human being. It's a part of the experience. It's what gives us the contrast and the color to our lives. However, we have to learn to be emotionally responsible. That's what I think we need to work with kids. That's what I think we need to work with adults on is, look, I will interact with you. I will do I will be extremely patient with you if you are emotionally responsible. The moment you say, I made you feel something, we're done. Because that is the only thing you have full control over. You don't have control over most things in life. But you do have control over what you are going to do with your emotions. And once again, this is something I wish you could come and speak to some of the groups that I'm involved. It's one thing when... Um, you know, when, when I will say it to my children or, you know, a bunch of our friends get around and talk, but when you hear it from an outside person who has proven that time and again, it's very powerful. I mean, you went and spoke, you did a TEDx at a prison, correct? Yeah. What was, uh, it seemed like, cause I watched, I watched that, you know, TED is something I love as well. And, and so it was a good combo, but I watched that when you spoke at Ironwood prison and the reception that you got from your audience. Was that, um, were, were you nervous at all about that, about going in there? Were you nervous about them maybe not accepting that message or not wanting to hear yeah, it? That, that was not the first prison I had spoken to. Okay. And so I had spoken to other prisons that I did not get that reception. Um, now, granted, you know, I had spoken to the previous prison maybe 10 years earlier, Um so I had grown up a lot. I was more comfortable with myself. I was more comfortable on stage. And I was more comfortable with my material. You know, it's when you're a speaker, so much of how your message is received is based on the presence that you bring when you're on stage. If you're timid and hoping and crossing your fingers that they'll like you, it's not going to usually go well. If you say, look, I'm here to love you and bring a message and you're going to do what you want with it, that's a totally different space mm -hmm. to be in. And so when I showed up at that prison, I, I showed up to serve. I, I did have a preconceived notion that they were going to be uh, more emotionally distant, um, like they had been in other prisons. Um, but I was very blessed to be so well received by this group and and then afterwards and i know this is going to sound weird but it's the truth i spent time in the lunchroom with the prisoners and there weren't like guards around me like i was just right next to these convicted murderers and people that had done heinous things yeah. and i had some of the best conversations about life i've ever had and when it was time that i had to go as weird as this might sound, I didn't want to leave. I was bonding with these gentlemen who had stories that I was just blown away by because, you know, when you make a mistake in life, uh, you have to pay a consequence on any, any level. But when you make a massive mistake, your consequence stays with you oftentimes for the rest of your life. Yeah. And these individuals made mistakes when they were 18, 19, 20. Now they're 50, 60, 70. Um, and you're a different human being. And it's not to say let everybody out just when years pass. That's not what I'm saying. But it's interesting to dialogue with people that have gone through the different things. I mean, I just remember thinking, 
what if I had been raised in their shoes? I would probably be in this prison as well uh, because I would have had the lack of the par- the parents uh, supervision. I would have I would have started in on drugs early. I would have been accepting wanting acceptance of joining a gang. Like I don't condone by any means bad actions, but I certainly have become more empathetic the more groups that I've interacted with. So I mentioned to you before we started this that I saw you speaking at the Congress for Future Medical Leaders, which is a huge annual gathering. This is in in the Boston area. How many there were thousands of teenagers yeah. in that well, room. Ten thousand. Yeah. yeah. So was it more nerve wracking to go speak to thousands of teenagers? Than to go into a prison. I mean, I have four teenagers, and getting up, you know, to get their attention is a little exhausting sometimes. You captured thousands of teenagers after they'd been sitting for days in this in this assembly. You know, I mean, but I had something in my back pocket that most people yeah. don't know. I had spoken for eleven years to schools, and yeah. so I knew that if I was loving and goofy and honest. I, I'd have them in the palm of my hand. Um, yeah. Whereas most adults that were to take that stage, they don't have those years right. of, of of experience. You know, I actually would rather speak to 10,000 teenagers than 20 CEO executives that are overwhelmed and, uh, you know, stuck on their, on their smartphone, not paying attention to me. Uh, and I and I've done both groups. Um, you know, I I think that kids still have such a appreciation for the imagination that when a guy like me comes out on stage and becomes animated and goofy and real with them, they they follow suit. They have a fun time with me. So it was effortless to speak to those ten thousand. And I, I've done it a few years now. I'm coming back again next year. And it is, it's seriously one of my favorite talks on my calendar every year. Awesome. We will be there too. So now I, now I know it gets a, gets yeah. a look forward to that as well. Um, so I'm going to ask you a different kind of question just because it's interesting to, to see what your, what your answer here is going to be. If you could pick somebody yeah. that you haven't met, because you have met a lot of people, by the way, I mean, you have met. I'm Bill Clinton, you've worked on Capitol Hill, you've met Tony Robbins is your mentor who wrote the forward for you, but you have met all sorts of people in all walks of life. But if there is somebody you haven't met that you could dial up the universe and meet today, who would it be? Why? And who would you bring to that meeting? Living or dead? Living. Okay. Living, um, I've really enjoyed watching the career of Will Smith. Um, I've seen his work ethic, and uh, I love his body of work, the movies, the music, the television. I mean, he's he's not human. Like, he's really not. <laughs> like, the number of things, the number of things that he's gone, gone to number one on is – you know, most people spend their whole lives and never even get that close in one area, and he's done it in multiple. So I'd love to just sit with him and, you know, laugh and talk and get to know him. That's been on my list for years. Um, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of comedy, and i just love to get in a room with some of the best comics today and just talk about life and uh share funny stories with them. I adore human beings, whether they, uh, they're in prison or they're world famous or they're world famous in prison. I mean, human (laughs) beings are incredible. I, when I meet somebody, I don't meet somebody like most meet people. When I meet them, I know I'm going to learn instantly things from them. I'm either going to learn what to do, what not to do, or both. That's it. So when I meet, I, you know, just this year, I met with an individual who is hated publicly around the world. And I met with him for an hour uh, and spent time getting to know him. And 
you know, I can see why people hate him. Uh, but I was still fascinated about like, wow, okay, this is not the behaviors that I want to ever amplify in my life. Um, this is why lots of people feel hurt by this individual. Um, and I learned, I, I didn't have the judgment of, I would never meet with that person. No, I'm like, Hey, let's, let's get to know this individual. I've never met them. And I, I always encourage my audience. I say, you have no problem hating someone you've never met, but it feels weird to you if I tell you to love somebody you've never met. And what's, what's jacked up about that? I mean, I, I don't need to know the listener on the other end of this program right now to love them. I can love them without needing a reason because they're a human being. They've endured things that I couldn't imagine. They, they've achieved things I'll never achieve. Every human being has fascinated me on this planet. So here at American Snippets, we focus on uh, um, Americans in general. We're, we're working to to reignite some of the optimism and the positive unification in this country in light of how it seems so divided in the past few years. We often focus on the military. That is our community. I'm the surviving spouse of a soldier um, who died in Iraq. And so much of the community I work in is military and families, and we've gotten involved involved with them. So we try to well, tie once, in- once somebody's in the military, the whole family's in the yes, military. Yes, yes, so that's true. Thank you for your service. We try to tie in a message to our military, our law enforcement, our first responder uh, on our on our shows. And one of the messages that I try to convey is that the best way Americans, that you don't have to go out and start an organization or deploy yourself or serve in uniform. There are so many ways you can serve the country or serve your community and even help our troops simply by living full lives that where you reach your potential and you show gratitude and maximize all the gifts we have in this country because other people serve the way that they do. So, but a lot of our troops come home and struggle to readjust, to acclimate back into the civilian world. Is there something that you would maybe have to offer to the troops or to family members trying to readjust to their family member coming home? Um, just a message of support or advice or some guidance you could give them upon their return home to help them as they make this transition now. Well, you know, there's a few parts to that question. Like, what would I say to a family member versus somebody who actually right. served? You know, it'd be a little different advice for each. Um, first of all, I'd, I'd want to make it clear that I have no clue what that feels like. Um, and there's something interesting that happens when you're honest about not knowing what something feels like. That actually makes somebody feel more welcomed and safe. Yes. Um, because when you try to act like, oh, you know, I had 200 broken bones. I know what trauma is. Therefore, I know what it's like to have a, you know, a bomb go off next to me. No, they're worlds apart. Right. Uh, but as I said earlier, pain is pain is pain. So while I don't know what that's like, I do know what it feels like to be scared. Yes. I do know what it feels like to have pain, physical pain. I do know what it feels like to go into a room and feel like, no one is like you. You know, I mean, I know that from the soldiers that I've worked with, you know, they are, they're taught things and they're, they're, they're exposed to things that the general populace could never even understand. Um, and then when they have to mingle in society and keep down that part that was encouraged when they were right. serving, that's very, very difficult. Um, and I can't imagine what that must feel like, but I can, I can honor the fact that that's not an easy road. Um, you know, they, I, from what I've heard, sometimes it's easier for a soldier to be in battle than to be at home. Yes. Uh, yes. Because in battle, they get to do what they are trained to do. They get to be in as much control as they feel they can be in. Um, and you also can very much become addicted to the adrenaline rush. And then when you go back and your adrenaline is like nowhere near as peaked, it's, it's very tempting to want to sabotage your life so that 
it can be chaotic again where you can be at peace. There are some people that are only at peace when they're in chaos. Um, and so my response to them is, I have no idea what you're going through, but I do know it's not easy. And my my first piece of advice would be, don't try to do it alone. Uh, whenever we try to navigate emotions and memories that are haunting by ourselves because we don't want to scare somebody, we don't want to make somebody feel awkward around us, and so therefore we try to do it all on our own, that can be a very dangerous, slippery slope. So don't do this alone. Get help. Talk to people who have actually gone through similar scenarios. They can relate to you. There is nothing, there is no defeat or weakness to asking for support. And I think that also can be a challenge because if, you know, you're in this high level position of like, you know, life or death and, and you always want to look like you have it all under control and then you come home and you got to ask for help, that feels weak. Uh, but it's not. It's actually, it, there's more strength in being vulnerable than there is hiding what you're going through. Um, and so definitely don't do this alone. Uh, also, what I would say is, and again, I can't compare what it's like 100%, but I'll do the best I can with what I know is, I can't roll into a room of people that are not disabled and act like, ugh, you all don't know what it's like to have a disability. You all have it good. And then play that game like, I have a worse hand right. and therefore you all need to tr treat me extra special and appreciate what I've gone through. That, att that attitude and energy will cause me to lose friends. And if you come back from being in a war or being a soldier and you come back and you think, I served all of you and, you know, you have no idea what it's like to be in the military and have life or death things, you know, you soccer moms are complaining, blah, blah, blah you're going to push away your humanity. You're going to push away people that actually would like to love you and take care of you and comfort you and care for you. But if you act like you've had it harder, you are going to alienate yourself. And you don't want to get into that trap. It's, again, just going to make it more lonely for you. I mean, there's so many things I could say, but those yeah. are the couple ones that surface for me. Well, those are those are good things to say. Those are important. Thank you. Um, as we wrap this up, I'm going to ask you to tell people where they can find out more about you, reach out to you, listen into your own podcast, um, maybe get some more information on it, what it is you do and who you are and see where you're speaking next. Sure. Well, I would tell you, go to uh, the Sean, S-E-A-N, Stevenson, S T E P H. E N S O N show S H O W dot com. <laughs> Go to the Sean Stevenson show dot com and I would subscribe and rate my podcast. Go through and listen to it. I, I come out with a podcast each week and I teach people how to get their stories out into the world. Um, and I believe everybody has a story. So maybe you never become a, a professional speaker, uh, but however, you have a story and if you can get in touch with your story and be able to share your story, you're going to be able to help and heal people. Awesome. Thank you so much again for taking the time to, to be with us. We are really excited to share your story. It's fun. It's always fun to tell, you know, your own story, but I get just as much, if not more enjoyment of telling other people's stories because for the same reason, you know, power and proximity, it helps me um, in my own path to learn from, to learn from people like you. So thank you so much. Well, you're quite welcome. Thank you for doing what you're doing. America certainly needs a ton of inspiration and great strategies. And, uh, you know, I appreciate what you're doing on this planet as well. Thanks. Thanks.